chapter number 12, and let me reiterate what you just read. In Ephesians chapter number 4, you have to put the passages together in order for the whole thing to come together. It's like putting a puzzle together. And when you take the bits and pieces of the puzzle, though you might see the overall picture on the box top, when you begin to put those pieces together, the picture begins to become more and more real, and it begins to, become, to make an idea of where it is that you're headed. When you look at the passage in Ephesians 4, he said, He that ascended, that would be Jesus Christ. Is that a fair statement? Is not he that descended where? First, where did he go? To the lower parts of the earth. Do you remember when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and the thief on the cross looked at him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your... Oh, how about that? Your kingdom. And you know what he said? Today thou shalt be with me in what? All right, now you got to remember that because I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise isn't heaven, though many Bibles try to make it heaven. Paradise has now been taken up to heaven, but it was not in heaven at the time the thief died. So we have a time issue that comes on. Now I remind you also this passage. When the Lord comes up, uh, Mary is there at the tomb crying. And you remember as she's crying, the Lord walks up behind her and she says, Where have you taken him? Where have you taken him? She thought he's the gardener. And he turned around and he said to her, Mary. And when she hears her name, she turns and says, Master or Rabboni, and she reaches out to touch him, or which would be very common to grab a hold of him around the feet, a sign of worship there. And he said, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. You want to remember that. You say, why? Because this is the day at the day he was resurrected. That means, if the Bible's right, Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 40, as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be where? Where? In the heart of the earth. He wasn't in heaven. He didn't ascend up to the throne. He didn't go up on high. What he said there is, is that Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days. That's Jonah. That's a transliteration from Hebrew to Greek. That's all that is. But what he's saying there is, is that as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When he comes up and is resurrected, Mary is the first one to see him there besides the angel. When Mary sees him there, he He says, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. That means he was somewhere else. It doesn't say he was in the tomb. His body was in the tomb, but his spirit had ascended to the Lord. Remember, he's up there and he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And then he says, it is finished. And the Bible says, into thy hands I commend my... So his spirit returns to God. That's the breath. That's the pneuma. That's the type of the Holy Spirit there. The spirit returns to God. That's just your breath, like a pneumatic drill. Air-driven, wind-driven drill, like pneumonia when you have wind trouble because you have pneumonia. His spirit returns to God. His soul goes into the heart of the earth, and his body goes into the tomb. Now this is what you have to try to understand and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Everything is going on in what many people called even the Egyptian folklore called it the underworld. Well, it's a literal underworld. In that underworld is a compartment called hell. That place is a literal burning place, a furnace, and that place down there is where unsaved individuals go, saved in the old, uh, saved, uh, I mean, lost in the Old Testament sense, not doing what God told them to do. Their destination is the same destination as people today who reject Jesus Christ. Their destination is hell. The compartment right across the great gulf fix there, take your Bible and come to Luke chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter number 15. These things are right here in the Bible, and many people have perverted them. But what he's trying to get across to you there is, is how could he be with the thief on the cross in paradise, and the thief on the cross doesn't go to heaven, he goes to paradise. You say, well, how do you know that, preacher? Because the Bible says the Lord was in the heart of the earth, so the thief couldn't have gone to heaven because the Lord hadn't yet ascended to heaven. Paradise must not be heaven then. Paradise is a place, a location in the heart of the earth. So you would have a compartment over here called hell where the Lord goes to preach to the spirits that are chained there and in prison and they're burning. He gets the keys of hell and death. Hell is one side, death is the other side over here. And across there in between is a great gulf fix which no man can cross. 
They're literally across a great gulf fix that individuals can see across. They're not looking up into heaven. They're looking across a great gulf fix. Look at it just to make sure we check it with what the Bible says. And you'll notice I uh, said 15. That should be 16. Excuse me. Verse number 19, I'll read kind of quickly through this. You probably know it by memory. A certain rich man, which was clothed purple and fine linen, spared sumptuously every day. A certain beggar, verse 20, named Lazarus, laid at the gate full of sores. Desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came, licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died. That would be Lazarus. And was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. Didn't have to be carried anywhere. His destination was already fixed. And he went straight there. The Bible said, and he went uh, and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now get the picture here. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He's hollering across a chasm there. He's hollering across a canyon, a, a big crevice there in the earth there. He's hollering across. He said, Father Abraham, he said, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, I'm tormented in the flame. Not a sermon on hell, but you need to remember that's a literal flame. Amen. Abraham said, Son, remember thou lifetime receiveth good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art in torment. Besides, verse 26, all this. Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us and would come from thence. In other words, he said, listen, uh, Lazarus is over there and he was poor and had nothing up there but a bunch of dogs licking his sores and I had everything and now he has everything and I have nothing and could you just send him over here and ask him to dip his finger in the water and come and cool my tongue over here? And Abraham is saying basically this, even if I wanted to, I can't. There's a chasm between us. There's a compartment on one side that is Abraham's bosom that is likened unto paradise or Abraham's bosom. It would be uh, like the Garden of Eden in a sense. And that's where those individuals all the way from Adam all the way through to the time of Jesus Christ dying, they wind up going all the way over here to paradise. And on the other side is a place called hell, a place of unmentionable and unbelievable torment. And in between is a gulf that even if you wanted to cross, you couldn't cross. That must be there in the same location. Where would they be? They'd be right in the heart of the earth. If you could drill down right now from any place on the earth and we would just drive straight down through the earth, if you could drive from the outside here to the center of the earth, you'd find a place down there called hell that is inhabited right now by souls. You don't have to worry about the devil being there. The devil's not there right now. He's in the great deeps and he's pretty much wherever he wants to be for now. He'll be confined to the bottomless pit, but not until the time of the millennium. If you could bind him, if you'd go ahead and bind him, we would all appreciate it very much. Uh, one of the things I wish a charismatic could do is they claim to bind the devil. I wish one day they'd bind him. I'd like to just have him bound for an hour or two. But you can't bind the devil. You can pray the blood of Jesus Christ and try to protect yourself from him, but you can't bind him at any rate. Now here's what happens to you, ladies and gentlemen. When these individuals died, if they've been keeping the law, they've been doing what they were commanded to do in the Old Testament, when they died, angels would come and take them down there to Abraham's bosom or to paradise, and they would stay there in complete comfort. That's where Samuel went. When Samuel uh, died, he was down there in the heart of the earth. That's where anybody in the Old Testament went. That's where the, the, uh, the thief on the cross went. When he went up there in paradise and the Lord went over into hell, 1 Peter 3, and he preached to the spirits in prison there and said, your destination is fixed and you're done for and now give me those keys right there. And he takes the keys of hell and death and he walks across the great gulf fixed, a type picture of him walking on the sea and he opens the door of death and he said, are y'all looking for somebody? I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. He spends three days with them down there. And according to Ephesians chapter number 4, after spending three days with them down there, you know what he does? He leads them cap cap captivity. They're held there in the heart of the earth. And he leads them captive. Take your Bible now, if you will, please, and turn over to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. I realize I'm running kind of fast here, but I, I want to try to get the picture for you to see. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and it often is. You get to see it after you see a commentary on it. Make it uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Um, when you see a commentary on it, then you might, it might make a little more sense to you. Oh, let's see. I think it's 12. I hope it's 12. It's on the bottom 
That's it. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. The Apostle Paul speaking now. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ. Notice where he's at. In Christ. New man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the what? Third heaven's where God dies. Here's your first heaven. It's the atmosphere. It's where the birds fly. It's where flying things are out there in the beast, the domesticated animals and otherwise in the first heaven. That's the, so, that's the air. Second heaven, solar system. That's where your stars and your planets are, your sun and your moon and that kind of a thing. That's between the firmaments. There's a firmament here and a firmament here. The Lord divided the waters from the waters. There's water down underneath the earth and there's water up above the earth. Not in the earth. The waters, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. That's up over your head and they rang down upon the earth and they rang down on the bottom, but that bottom of the gravity would pull it this way. That's another story. But here's what has to happen. They got first heaven atmosphere, second heaven solar system. Third heaven, that's where God dwells. It's separated by a frozen firmament. There's a door in it. The Lord cracked that door open one time when He spoke to the Apostle Paul over there. At the time, he was named Saul. And Paul said, I saw, uh, I saw a light brighter than the sun. What happened to you? Burn the eyes out of my head. It caused me to be blinded and that kind of a thing. Why? Because he cracked it open. You ever wonder why in the book of Revelation he tells you that there's no need for the sun or the moon in the New Jerusalem? Because the Lamb is the light thereof. You know why? All of His glory is reflected upward. That thing is like a mirror. On the bottom side, Paul says, you see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. What are you looking at? You're looking on the bottom side of a mirror. No reflection here. But you get on the top side of that, all of His glory is reflected up. You say, what's above the third heaven? Eternity. How far does it extend? Forever. Who's the light of it? He is. How far does the light extend? It dispels any darkness anywhere. His light just goes out. It never loses its power no matter what, how far the distance is it travels. We're talking about the eternal Godhead is what you're talking about. His light doesn't get dimmer the further away it goes. It'll be just as bright 20 million light years away as it's bright there at this originating source. That's the light so bright it doesn't cast a shadow. There's no heaven, no shadows in heaven. You have to walk around and try to say, why? The light is so bright it consumes everything around you. You can't cast a shadow up there. You say, why? It's too bright. When you get up there to heaven, if the Lord doesn't do something for your eyes, you're going to have cataracts on your eyes. It's going to burn your eyes out. So you get up there to the third heaven, and Paul says this. When he got to the third heaven, what did he find? The Bible says, and I knew a man, verse number 3, uh, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell, how that he was caught up into... I thought he said it was heaven. He said it was in the third heaven, didn't he? Well, if paradise is in the heart of the earth where Abraham's bosom is, according to what you just read in Luke 16, how in the cat hair did it wind up over there? Ephesians chapter number 4, he led captivity captive. He took them in a, on a space ride. <laughs> he took them out. And they're up there in the third heaven. So now, after the atonement has been made, if someone is saved, if you die in this day and age, here's what happens to you. You're absent from the body and you're present with the Lord. You know how quick? Like that. Like that. Twinkling of an eye. People say, well, you step through a veil or whatever. Paul said he was caught up. There's a sensation of going up. There's a sensation of you moving upward. You say, why? It's called the sides of the north in the Bible. It's Mount Zion, that great city of the king, in the sides of the north. That's where his throne is. It's out there past Alpha Draconis, the dragon star. It's out there past the north star. It's over there on the other side, up in the third heaven. You can't get there from here except through him. You can't get there in a spaceship. You can't travel in one of them Star Trek things or nothing. You can't say, beam me up, Scotty. You have to say, beam me up, Jesus. Amen. He's the only one that's got the keys to get you in up there. Everybody that was down there in paradise is now up there in heaven. You say, what are they doing? They're awaiting the Lord to get finished with everything, so they come down and inherit a kingdom. That kingdom is a kingdom of heaven down here on this earth. It's not the kingdom of God. You say, why? Nobody in the Old Testament had a new birth. I showed you that the other day. There's no way for them to have a new birth. You say, why? Because Jesus Christ hadn't died yet. That's why they didn't go there. 
Brother Josh, could you bring that chart to me and let me show you, uh, show you folks a couple of things if I could, please. Now, in the, in the book of Revelation, maybe Matthew, you and Brother Waters here could help hold the thing up here. In the book of uh, Matthew, uh, I mean, excuse me, in the book of Revelation, you find out that there's souls under the altar, and those souls that are under the altar there have to do with the tribulation saints that have their head cut off because they don't take the mark of the beast. And they cry out to the Lord, How long, O Lord, until thou avenge us? In other words, when are you coming down for the second coming to take vengeance on the Antichrist and his cronies who cut off our head? And the Lord said, Keep your shirt on. I'll be down there to get you sooner or later. And he takes them out in a post-tribulation rapture, which I'll have to show you a little bit later on in another evening. But when you start talking about this time period, ladies and gentlemen, maybe, um, I don't know if you can see this or not, down here at the bottom is where we're at. Anybody from over here where Adam is, all the way over here to Jesus Christ, where he dies on Calvary's cross and just a little bit past that, any of those individuals right there go down here to this place called paradise. My other chart seems to show it, I think, a little bit better than that. But there's a paradise that's down here in the bottom and there's hell down here. When he leads captivity captive, what he does is he comes up over here at the resurrection. He stops. He's been down for three days. He stops. He goes up and makes a people being dropped off here, paradise, because it was down here, but now it's up here. And then he comes back down for 40 days and spends some time there with the apostles and some of the other people that are there. And in the meantime, all of those individuals that are down here are up here, except, might I mention, the ones that were in hell. Right. You say, where are they? They're still there. Amen. All the way from the days of Adam. The first one that got dropped into that bucket over there would be a man named Cain. You say, why? He was a murderer from the beginning. His daddy might have been the devil, who knows what that may be, and there some, seems to be some validity to that. But the bottom line is, he was a murderer from the beginning, and when Cain died, he populated hell. And it started from there. Anybody that rejected whatever God wanted them to do during one of these time periods here, they would go to hell, and if they did what they were supposed to do, they would go down to paradise. That thing got taken out in Ephesians chapter number 4 when the Lord led up and then from that point forward, anybody that died in Christ wound up going up here to heaven and He started formulating the body of Christ. Now, let me show you while these fellows are here and then I'll let you take a break there as I know this thing is unbelievably heavy for you. <laughs> Matthew's not sweating at all. You guys are kind of like, you know, okay, good, you'll take advantage of it. Yeah. <laughs> During this time period right here, what kingdom exists? Come on, don't be hesitant. What is it? Nobody will turn the tape off if you're nervous. What kingdom? How do you get in this kingdom? You got to be born again. This kingdom is not meat and drink. It can't be observed. It is where? Inside you, right? So you get it by a new birth. All of these kingdoms here are what? Kingdom of what? Heaven. Kingdom of heaven. After this is over with, what are they looking for? And where's this? Both kingdoms are here, but the kingdom of heaven because it's a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Okay? See, you're getting it. You're Bible scholars already. You didn't even realize that. Now, if you can understand this right here, you'll understand why there is a problem with purgatory, why there is a problem with people teaching soul sleep, why there is a problem where people trying to teach people to say in the Old Testament, same way they're saved in the New Testament. Well, if that's so, ladies and gentlemen, why didn't they go to the same place? That's a simple question. Well, if they're saved the same way, why can't they go to heaven? If they're saved the same way, how come no new birth is offered to anybody back here? Everything here is connected with works. You know what it says here? Revelation 12, Revelation 14, Revelation 20. You know what he says in this passage here? He said, these are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. You know what he says right here? He says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift, it is the gift, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what you have to have over here? You got to have works. You know what you have to have here? Works. You know what you have to have here? Works. You know what you have to have here? Works. It's true all the way through the whole thing until you come to this age right here and it's not of works and then you jump here, it's works, and then here it's all works. No faith here. 
This is all works here. The only place that works is not connected is in this age. Now, if you take this right here, people can lose their salvation during this time period. Hebrews chapter number 6 very plainly proves that. Those are they that have tasted the good word of God and so on and so forth and it's impossible to renew them again under repentance, etc., etc. That takes place in the verses 7 to about 13 there in Hebrews chapter number 6. Right here, that individual, you take that and put it here, you got a Christian losing his salvation because he's not living right, doing right, acting right, and spitting white. He's not witnessing, he's not doing what he ought to be doing, whatever the church uh, mantra is to do. You take this right here and say they're saved the same way. You can take the mark of the beast, you can do whatever. You say, why? Because it doesn't make any difference. No, the Bible says you take the mark of the beast, you're damned. Amen. You're cursed is what the Bible says. You see what happens is every time you take this right here and you put it over here, you'll be, uh, you'll be cursed, you'll be taken and uh, have a spear run through you and you'll be stoned to death. You say, why? You're teaching faith, no works. It's important for you to understand that. If you take this church age doctrine and you apply it over here in the law under Moses, you're up the creek with no means of motivation. You say, why? The only way you could get in is through the law. That's why I gave the law. You say, yeah, but the law is a schoolmaster. Yeah, to show them they couldn't keep it. But you understand that after you see it through Paul's eyes. So it's important for you to understand that every doctrine that you hear taught in these other things is a truth misplaced. And whenever they bring those other kingdoms and try to put them down right here, you're headed for some serious trouble because right here, that's every time it's going to add works to it. You know what else it does? There's no eternal security anywhere else here, probably with the exception of the assured mercies of David given to him and maybe his son. But beyond that, ladies and gentlemen, nobody has eternal security. They're kept by works. You're kept by Jesus. Amen. Now, if you try to make that by works, you know what you can do? You can hold a congregation of people in bondage until they get so wore out with it, they just give up. Amen. Because nobody can live it if you're honest. Amen. If you're honest. Amen. You can be confined to a wheelchair and you can't live it because you can't control that brain. Amen. All right, so that's the thing that I wanted to try to show you tonight to make sure it's clear. Then I'm going to run over a couple of things here with the two kingdoms right quick. But that's basically it. Anybody that dies over here, they wind up going down to either hell or to paradise, Abraham's bosom. And after the death of Jesus Christ, they still die and go to hell or they go to heaven when they're saved. In the tribulation period, they don't come to heaven. They can't. They're not in the body of Christ. They go to the heart of the earth. They're taken out at the, uh, at the last uh, uh, tribulation, at the post-tribulation rapture there, right before the second coming of Christ, which is right here. They died during this time period. How can they go to heaven? Jesus Christ is there. Well, where would they go? People die in the millennium. Saved people die in the millennium. They don't have their eternal body yet. You say, where do they go? They go to the heart of the earth. They go to await the time, Revelation 11, where they receive their reward that's out there. The millennium is not eternity, ladies and gentlemen. People still die. They just live a long time. A child will be 100 years old. But you have them living to be seven and 800 years. You say, why? Because the earth has been put back on its proper axis now. And now all of a sudden everything is working like it's supposed to. But just because Jesus Christ is here doesn't mean people don't die. There's just no war and those other kind of things that take place. They wind up going to the heart of the earth. And the other ones go to hell on earth. Literally. Don't fear him that can cast the body, uh, kill the body. Fear him that can cast both body and soul into hell. Literally, hell on earth. You ever heard a church that teaches that? Sure you have. Seventh-day Adventists teach that. You say, what happens? Hell on earth, don't you see? I saw the newspaper headline the other day, this predator, this pervert that got arrested from Hollywood and all that kind of a deal. They say he's in hell. Oh, no, he's not, man. He's in a cushy cell or he's out on his ankle bracelet right now. He ain't burning. But in this time right here, down in the Valley of Gehenna, there's a literal hell burning on the earth. And Jesus Christ commands an angel and they're cast right there while you're watching them go there. And they go into hell and they burn to the end of the millennium. And at the end of the millennium, there's a battle of Gog and Magog. And then we come up here to the great white throne judgment. And then it's the lake of fire down at the very end. So as the old preacher used to say, he'd draw a picture of hell over here. And he'd say, out of the frying pan and into the fire. And that's what you do. All right, you got it all down, Pat? You ready to take a, take a sheet of paper and get you a test now? <laughs> Pop quiz. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, you can just set it down, roll it up, whatever you want to do there.
All right. Does that make things clear for you? All right. Look, if you will, please, in uh, John chapter number 3. John chapter 3. Well, let me just give you a couple more things here to go back over, and then we'll go to the barn for tonight. John chapter number 3. Um, can you bring me that board real, real quick, please? Do you mind? I need, he'll need more than just him. I mean, he can pick it up, but it's too bulky to move. John chapter number 3. Now, uh, the, this is another question that came up about this. Uh, they said, well, how come in the book of John, uh, if it's mostly Jewish, how come it is that he has about being born again? Because John is written, for those of you that don't know, I'll, I'll go back over that. John is written 25 years after Pauline Revelation. When I say Pauline Revelation, let me clarify that. That's 25 years after the books of Romans to Philemon have been written. The books that the Apostle Paul now clearly says that you're saved by grace through faith and clearly the kingdom of God is preached and taught in there. So John now clearly sees what that is. When Jesus Christ first came down, He said, John the Baptist preaching the kingdom of heavens at hand, the kingdom of heavens at hand. What's He talking about? The millennial kingdom is at hand. Literally, a rulership is at hand, but it's going to require Him dying. The kingdom of God is at hand, but they don't even know how to get into it. None of their scholars, ladies and gentlemen, knew how to get into it. Even Nicodemus, who was a master, because the Lord said to him, Nicodemus, haven't you read Psalms 22? Haven't you read Isaiah chapter 53? Don't you know the other places where the church is veiled over there? Don't you understand that the kingdom of God's at hand, that I'm the kingdom of God, and that once I die, if you're born again? Know what Nicodemus says in John 3? He says, the Lord says, you must be born again. You can't, otherwise, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, well, how's a man to be born again, especially at my age? What do I do? Get back in my mother's womb and come out a second time? And the Lord said, no. A man has to be born of water first and of the Spirit. Fleshly birth and spiritual birth. Two natures, both have to be born. You cannot be born again until you've been born, first of all, physically. Two natures, born of water, not baptism, water. Mother's water breaks and the baby gets born. Water had to come down, had to break for the Lord to come down. It's a picture of a bunch of things. You break the water in baptism. It's a type picture of the new birth. You're coming up out of the water from the deeps. So what he says there is, you must be born again. They didn't know how to be born again. See, you know how to be born again. He says to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how do I do that? And he said, well, you have to be, have two natures. But he doesn't tell him how to do it. And that's for him to get the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus believed enough to get the kingdom of heaven. He didn't ever tell him how to get the kingdom of God. You say, why? It hadn't been revealed to Paul yet. Jesus hasn't even died on the cross yet. Even though it's veiled through there, they could read Psalm 22 all day and think it was David talking. They could read Isaiah 53 and they didn't understand. The Bible said, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Even their Old Testament prophets couldn't see it. They didn't know it was there. But He's telling you the truth. It's just not revealed yet. The facts are there. They just don't see them until later on. Now, when you and I read uh, John chapter number 3, you come down there, the kids quote it. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And you're thinking, okay, Nicodemus didn't get that. He didn't even know what he was talking about. And then he realizes he's fixing to go to the cross and be crucified. And later on down the line, uh, of course, Joseph of Arimathea gives him his tomb to lay in. But they still don't know how to get into that kingdom. If they had accepted him as the Messiah and got the kingdom of heaven after he died, he would have been able to tell them how to get the other kingdom. But he hadn't even died yet. You have to understand that to keep your Bible straight. The nation of Israel were looking for a military ruler to come. That's what had been predicted in Isaiah chapter 40. They were looking for a man to take over a throne and to get Rome off their neck. To go through all the years of slavery they had been through and all the years they'd been in captivity. And finally Rome has got their foot on their neck and they're looking for it. That's why the lady over there, the woman over there at the well, she comes up and says, Are you the one we've been hearing about? Are you the one that's supposed to come that our ancestors have told us about? You're the liberator. That's why the Jews were, I mean, why the Romans, Romans were in such an uproar. They thought the guy was going to come have a military overthrow like he was an insurrectionist. 
The Jews tried to get on board with that. That's what Barabbas was doing. He's trying to be in there and play like he's the Messiah. He's the guy. I'm bringing in the kingdom. I'm going to fix everything. And we're going to cause an insurrection here. And Jesus comes in and he does what? He says, listen, I'm going to die for it. I'm not here to take it this way. Else would my army fight for me now. Pilate, how are you doing? You a king? Yep. Are you coming over here to take over? No. If I was, they'd come fight for me and I'd take it over. But I'm not here for this. I'm here to give them a chance to get this. If they accept me, there's nothing you or Caesar or Herod or anybody else can do to keep me from getting it. But if they don't accept me, then guess what? I'm going to go ahead and take that physical kingdom out of here and I'm going to set that thing up for Gentiles and it's not going to be about rulership. It's not going to be about a government. It's not going to be about taking over anything. It's about setting them up for eternal life and I'm going to show them something I never showed one Jew anywhere in the Bible. He made that for you. He would have given that to them, but they rejected Him. So as a result, you wind up getting this kingdom right here. That's not meat and drink. This kingdom right here comes by a new birth. How do you have a new birth? Why, the youngest of you in here knows how to do that. Don't you? I bet I could talk to some of you girls. I bet you could give me the plan of salvation with no problem at all, without even a hiccup. I bet you could lead somebody to Jesus Christ faster than the grown people in, in a lot of churches. I bet you know how to do that. You've been around here long enough. Your youth pastor, your, my associate has taught you. These other preachers have taught you. Your parents have taught you. You can do it and recite it in your sleep which I don't always recommend the Romans Road. Revelation Road's a better road if you go down. You know, you take them over to the great white throne and see the books are open and uh, the dead are judged out of the books and so on and so forth and, and the, the, the sea gives up the dead and all that and everybody's judged out of that book and the ones that are not in that book are cast into the lake of fire. That's a good place to start your witness. And then behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation chapter number 3, if any man open and come in, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. And then take them to Revelation, I mean to Romans, and show them that they're sinners and that God gave you a, a free gift out of that. But in the meantime, you need to understand when you're reading something about this right here, Israel knew nothing about that. The reason you see it clear in the book of John is you have on Pauline glasses. There's a master of the scripture right there and he can't see it. You know what that reminds me to say? That reminds me to say if the Holy Spirit doesn't open your eyes, you can't see it. You're blind as a bat flying backwards. In the book of Romans, he teaches you that all of a sudden what happens is, is the Lord can create you with a reprobate mind because you reject, you reject, you reject, you reject, you reject. And then the Lord finally says, okay, your conscience is seared. And he may still deal with you, but you're unable to see it. You ever been with somebody come over to the book of... Um, uh, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, I'm, I'm trying to hurry. Are we doing okay? I'm giving you a lot of information real fast. If you slow it down to normal speed, you probably get about two hours out of what I'm giving you now. <clears throat> but that's the best way to cover it. It's just cover it often and rapidly. Hopefully it keeps your attention. 2 Thessalonians. Uh, when, when, ladies and gentlemen, if you could grab a hold of this right here, what it'll do is, is when you're reading your Bible, you'll start realizing, like a lady told me this week, how special you are to be in the body of Christ. He revealed things to you He did not reveal to any of the Old Testament prophets. Ain't that something? You know what He calls them? He calls them mysteries. Do you know why they're mysteries? Because nobody knew them. You know who He revealed the mysteries to? A Jew that is being sent to the Gentiles. To show them what? A kingdom they couldn't see, that they get by what? Faith and not by... How about that? We get it by faith and not by sight. They were looking for something they could see. He's trying to bring them something they can't see. He said both kingdoms are right here in front of you, in one man, the king of both of them. You know what they said? <laughs> Whatever, you're not the ruler we're looking for. We have no king but who? His blood be upon us and upon our children's children. Okay. Well, they sure got it. That's God's chosen people. <laughs> you ever think about that? If God does that to His chosen people, where would that leave you if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. My goodness, man. 
you get to look into that thing over. Paul's from the tribe of Benjamin, but you get to look into that thing Brother Justin and I were talking about, or Josh, one of them, were talking about this morning about that remnant going up there at the end of the last day. No, it was Brother Chase about the remnant of the tribe of Benjamin. All the other tribes turn on them and they run out there and hide in the hills and stuff. There's only five or 600 left and they have to have some women come down there so they can not uh, completely extinguish the tribe. That's the tribe Paul was from. A bunch of outcasts, a bunch of vagabonds, a bunch of misfits, a bunch of left-handers. Uh, throw, the, throw the sling and knock a gnat off of a fence post at 100 yards. That's the Apostle Paul that God used as a Jew to reach you Gentiles. And I'm one of you. And he showed you things through the Apostle Paul that he didn't show anybody else. Now if you want to feel special about something, feel special about what God did for you to do that. That made his atonement, which was going to be for Israel and for the, for the sojourners and the strangers that got in through Israel, that made his atonement personal for you. Ain't that something? You should appreciate that. He died for me. Yeah, he sure did. You got it. And he gave it to you free. Do you know how hard it is for somebody looking for that to accept something for free? Peter said, I'm ready to fight for it. The Lord said, you got to die for it. Peter said, give me a sword. The Lord said, grab a towel. <laughs> Peter said, I'm going to stab him. The Lord said, I'm going to surrender. You see the difference? I'm going to take it. I'm going to die for it. We just sang that song tonight, you know. Now I've given to Jesus every... <coughs> <coughs> everything everything I'll bet there's a thing or two right now that if you were to go home and find it missing or somebody in your family or something gone I bet you might maybe think you hadn't given like you ought to give he gave everything now I'll show you this thing in 2 Thessalonians and we'll go to the barn. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and this is the final question that came up and then we'll get back to the kingdoms on Sunday. I'll be in Chicago this week and the boys will take good care of you on Wednesday and then uh, I'll be back for, uh, for the Sunday service. Now notice what he says here. Uh, let's pick it up, if you will, please, in verse number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by the word nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Not day of the Lord, that's the second coming. The day of Christ, that's the rapture of the church. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Daniel said, the abomination of desolation. When he goes over there and sets up an image there, the Jew realizes, uh-oh, that's not the right guy. He is making desolate the temple, and they head for the red rock city of Petra. And I have to cover that a little bit later on. Now watch, the Bible says this, come all the way down, verse 6. And now we know what withholdeth that he, that be the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, until the man of sin's gone and then the devil will show up on the throne. And then shall that wicked, the capital W there because it's personified, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming so that you clearly understand who that is he's talking about. That's the devil, but the devil doesn't show up until the Antichrist is taken out of the way. Even him, the devil, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish... Now watch it. Why do they perish, verse 10, right after the semicolon there? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So they had a chance to escape this, but because they didn't, the Bible said they're going to be deceived, and the Bible said they're going to perish, and for this cause shall God send them, shall who send them? 
God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now we're going to continue the thought. That's what that colon means right there. Watch in the next sentence. That they all might be damned who believe not the tr truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The unrighteousness there is is to reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in other words, an individual says, well, I'll wait for this rapture thing to take place and what do I do in case I miss the rapture and so on and so forth. There's nothing you can do. You've heard the gospel. The Bible said God's going to cause you to be deceived and you're going to perish, meaning not just in your physical sense. Your soul is going to go to hell and you're going to come up later on and be cast into the lake of fire. Your chance is over. There is no second chance after the rapture takes place. Once that rapture takes place, your friends and loved ones who have heard you give them the gospel time and time and time again, they can't get saved in the tribulation. They can't see it. God veils it where they can't see it. They worship and serve the Antichrist as the devil, as God. And they think He's the God that's come down here to do what? Bring in the... Well, lo and behold, we're right back to Genesis 1.1. The devil comes down, he's been cast to earth and his time is short and he's down here to bring in the kingdom. And he brings in all of his cronies and brings in all the things and hell belches out all of our demons and they come out here and the devil is ruling and reigning over the earth. He's got that kingdom under wraps right there. The only thing stands in his way, which is a minuscule amount of people if you imagine it, 144,000 male virgin Jews and Moses and Elijah, two witnesses. Best I can count, that's 144,000 too. And there'll be some converts. But that's not much considering the population of the entire world that's being left over. And the devil has a reign of terror. He starts off with pain, I mean with uh, peace and flatteries, and then turns that thing into pain and just destroys the population. But he's bringing in this kingdom. It's an earthly kingdom. You know what people are looking for? Make things better on earth. Make things better on earth. You know what he'll be calling? Thy kingdom come. He'll come down out of the sky after we've gone out and he'll say, the kingdom's here. The kingdom's here. I'm the king of the kingdom. I'm the ruler of the world. There you are. You're right back how he set it up. He's quoting the Bible the whole time. And he say, well, you said you'd destroy the temple and build it in three days. And he said, yeah, and I'm in it too. The Antichrist will lay in state probably three days. And at the end of the third day, up he'll come. The temple may be thrown down and then he'll build it back up and he'll go back inside there. You say, what? It'll be something people can see. They won't be teaching anything by faith. They'll be teaching everything by works. You say, what? Don't you know the devil's system is set up by works? Sure it is. You know how you keep peace with the devil in the tribulation? You can't buy, sell, or get gain unless you have the mark. You do everything he tells you to do and you're in, and if you don't, you die. It's works. It's slavery. And it doesn't take long to change. What happens to all my friends and family? Get them saved now. Get them saved right now. And if they balk at it, show them that passage. Say, well, I preached to you what the Bible says. I told you what the Bible says. And I don't want to see you go to hell. I'd love to see you go to heaven. I'd love to be able to spend eternity with you and be able to have what would be the pleasure of having a glorified body and a mind like Jesus Christ. And sure would like to see you there. But let me just give you the warning if you're not going to do that. The Bible says that after I'm gone, the Lord is going to send you strong delusion. And even if you wanted to believe the truth, you couldn't. You're going to believe a lie. These preachers that are telling you that after the rapture there's a second chance are full of prunes. They're not preaching the Bible. You don't have a second chance. Do you understand the urgency to tell people now? You say, why? Maybe the rapture happens tonight. You got friends or loved ones? Tell them now. You say, well, preacher, I've been praying and praying and praying and praying. Yeah, and the devil would have you believe that it don't make any difference at all. It does make a difference. It matters to God. Keep asking them to save them. Keep asking them to get them right. Keep asking them to do the, get the prodigal straightened out. I can't tell you how to do it, but don't quit asking them to do it. Amen. And he may take care of it and he may not, but don't quit asking them to do it. If you have lost, one, uh, lost friends or loved ones that are, that are lost, get them saved now because once you get raptured, they don't get a second chance. Kids, you're fixing to get out of school. You realize you may go to youth camp this year and you may not return back to school. You may never see your friends again. You say, why? Well, you could be dead. Or you could be raptured. And then at the end of that thing, you're going to come up there at the great white throne and your friends are going to come out of hell 
and the smell of boiled eggs and sulfur on them, and they're going to stand in front of you, and they're going to look right at you and say, you said you were my friend, and you never even bothered to tell me? I'm not trying to put pressure on you. You can tell them. You can be nice about it. You don't have to be a jerk. You can be kind, but you should tell them. All right, I hope that makes some sense to you. Let's uh, stand together and we'll be dismissed. Now, I'm going to keep going through this until you get a hold of it. And, and if you have questions, don't you hesitate to ask questions. Don't you worry about asking questions. Uh, this week I've heard this more than probably any other statement. I know this is probably a stupid question, but... No, it's not stupid. You don't know. You weren't taught. You know, well, preacher, I'm going through this now for about the fourth time, and I'm finally starting to see something. Good. Me too. I'm the same way. That thing's a bottomless well. You never get to the bottom of it. It just keeps bubbling up, and you're thinking, well, where's the source? Well, it's Jesus. He's eternal. Pretty deep well. Amen. So you just let it keep bubbling, and you get a little more, and you get a little more, and you get a little more, and then we get to heaven, and then the Lord will show us stuff we never even knew existed. All right. Brother Justin, you did a great job today leading the music. And uh, I sure appreciate you.